Good morning. A quorum being present, the Committee on Education and Labor uh, will, will come to order. Today we have one item scheduled for markup, H.R. 5663, the Minor Safety and Health Act of 2010. Uh, we meet this morning to consider urgently needed legislation to address serious life-threatening flaws in our nation's workplace health and safety laws. Since the April disaster in the Upper Big Branch mine, the committee has received substantial testimony from miners and their families, representatives of coal mines, the state and federal officials, and independent experts. All of them urged us to take decisive actions to reform our nation's mine safety laws. For those who still stout, doubt the need for reform, we learned only last week of additional alleged misconduct at the Upper Big Branch Mine. NPR reported that a Massey uh, electrician was ordered by the company to circumvent the methane detector installed in the continuous mining machine last February in violation of the law. If true, it is unconscionable. H.R. 5663, which will be renamed the Robert C. Byrd Miner Safety and Health Act, makes comprehensive common sense reforms to strengthen our nation's mine safety laws. First, the bill addresses the broken pattern of violation provisions developed in the wake of the 1976 Scotia mine disaster. Unfortunately, this more than three decades old provision is riddled with loopholes and delays that allows unscrupulous mine operators to abuse the law. Massey's Energy's Upper Big Branch Mine is a clear example of this. The Upper Big Branch Mine was subject to 515 violations and 54 withdrawal orders in 2009. And yet because of regularly contested and su a substantial number of citations to avoid the pattern of, of it regularly contested a substantial number of, of citations to avoid the pattern designation, it evaded MSHA's more stringent enforcement regime. Thus, while the mine, the mine corrected unsafe conditions when it was confronted by MSHA inspectors, it repeatedly slipped back into a pattern of noncompliance. This legislation will set clear yet fair criteria to identify mines with significant safety problems in a way that cannot be gained by the operators. Second, the bill gives miners additional protections against retaliation if they speak up about dangerous conditions. Stanley Goose Stewart testified last week about the persistent fear and intimidation faced by workers from Massey management at Upper Big Branch Mine. These are the same fears the media reported on workers the, on the deep water horizon when it confronted with dangerous working conditions. That is why the Minor Safety and Health Act will empower workers to speak up about safety concerns by strengthening whistleblower protections <clears throat> and give miners the right to refuse to work in unsafe conditions. We need to recognize that special protections are needed for workers in cases where the work is inherently dangerous and, and pressure by company executives is intense, especially given the huge economic incentives to produce more coal at all costs. That is why this bill will ensure that management has good cause for dismissing an underground coal miner. Companies should not be, should not be able to retaliate against workers who raise legitimate concerns about safety under the pretext that they're not doing their job. Third, the bill gives MSHA additional powers to shut down a mine and provide meaningful sanctions against those who interfere or impede with MSHA's inspections by giving advance notice. Finally, H.R. 5663 strengthens a broadly outdated Occupational Safety Health Act. Every day, 14 workers don't come home from work. While they don't make headlines like trapped miners do, their lives and limbs are no less valuable. Under the bill, civil penalties will be increased for the second time in 40 years and indexed to inflation like nearly every other federal law. Strong whistleblower protections in this legislation granted to miners will be extended to all workers and the requirements that, that employers abate health and safety hazards pending an appeal will be extended to all workplaces, not just minors. In the last three and a half years, we have held at least 24 he hearings examining the problems in our nation's worker health and safety laws. Many sectors within the mining industry, the Department of Labor, NIOSH, workers, families, academics, and state officials have provided valuable assistance to shaping the bill and the substitute amendment that I'm offering shortly. None of us who went to Beckley could forget the pleas of the families, the family members and minors. Witness after witness sent the same message. We have to do more to protect our nation's coal miners. We cannot ignore the commitment we made to the families of Aracoma, Sago, Crandall Canyon and Darby to never forget the sacrifice their loved ones made and to honor their memory with mine safety laws that we can be proud of and that will protect them. Families should not live in fear that their loved ones will not come home after their shift. It is our job to ensure that they have a safe workplace. I urge my colleagues to support this important legislation. 
I now recognize uh, Congressman Klein, the senior Republican of the committee, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, all. The explosion at Massey Energy's Upper Big Branch coal mine claimed the lives of 29 workers and forever changed the lives of their families and communities. While progress has been made over the last several decades to improve mine safety, tragedies like the one at the Upper Big Branch mine remind us more work remains. Republicans firmly believe Congress must take responsible action to further mitigate the dangers of underground mining and advance our shared goal of preventing such a tragedy from ever happening again. It is clear a step should be taken to modernize our laws, toughen penalties on bad actors, and guarantee the federal government is meeting its obligation to fully enforce the law. I appreciate the Chairman's sense of urgency, but regrettably, I cannot support this legislation. Congress does not do well when sweeping reforms are written without a sincere effort to include bipartisan ideas and are expedited to meet the demands of a legislative agenda rather than create sound public policy. Yet that is precisely the circumstance in which this legislation was produced. The Democrats' proposal is, a massive, is massive in both size and scope. Even the Congressional Budget Office has been unable to quantify the cost and consequences of this proposal because of its sheer magnitude and the repercussions that would flow to virtually every workplace in the nation. The sweeping nature of the legislation is all the more troubling when we consider that not a single investigation, not a single investigation into the Upper Big Branch tragedy is complete. We do not know what caused this tragedy. We do not know which laws were not followed, which laws were not enforced, and which laws were simply inadequate. Without knowing the answers to those questions, it would be irresponsible to move forward with legislation this broad. The bill is riddled with legal traps and punitive measures, a benefit to trial lawyers, perhaps, but not beneficial in advancing mine safety. The bill threatens to criminalize what people know rather than their willful actions those generally taken with a bad purpose to intentionally violate the law. This potentially creates a disincentive for employers to proactively examine safety conditions and prevent accidents before they occur. And perhaps most troubling, the broad changes to the OSHA Act, changes wholly unrelated to minor safety, will drive up costs and litigation for job creators at a time our country can least afford it. Workplace safety is an ongoing priority for this committee and for our nation. OSHA reform is a worthwhile pursuit, but it is unfair and unreasonable to attach these radical changes to a bill that is being rushed through Congress in the wake of a mining tragedy. I urge my Democratic colleagues to strike this misplaced yeah, overhaul of the OSHA Act so we can work together on a common sense reform that will strengthen mining safety, period. These are a few of the concerns I and my Republican colleagues have with the Democrats' legislation. No doubt additional concerns will be raised today. Despite our concerns, we realize the majority is determined to move forward without all the facts. Given this timetable, Republicans have identified preliminary, er preliminary areas of reform we believe are important to improving minor safety. We will propose reforms in which we believe Republicans and Democrats can find common ground while recognizing a better response to the upper big branch tragedy would be to act when the causes are understood. What we will not do is bog down a package of targeted mine safety reforms with controversial and questionable changes to the OSH Act. With so many questions involving the upper Big Branch mine disaster still unanswered, I will, perhaps for the first time ever, suggest we look to the Senate for guidance. With various state and federal investigations underway and their findings expected in the coming months, we simply do not have a complete picture of what went wrong in West Virginia. Our colleagues on the other side of the Capitol will not even introduce legislation until the fall, and I know at a minimum those on the Republican side share my belief that we should allow the investigations to be completed before legislating. Instead of acting hastily, our counterparts in the Senate are engaged in bipartisan negotiations to identify shared concerns and allow data to guide their work. A little more time is something I think we could all use here in this committee. In fact, the majority did not circulate the final amendment in the nature of a substitute, the actual legislative text to be amended and voted upon today, until approximately 10.30 last night. The revised text contained two substantive policy changes. Whether such changes have merit or not, their circulation just under 12 hours before the committee was to set to meet for a vote indicates this bill is simply not ready to advance. I have no doubt there are areas of common ground to improve minor safety. If my Democratic colleagues would take the time to legislate responsibly, set aside their plans for a vast and unrelated expansion of the federal government, and put the safety of miners first. Every day, miners work under dangerous conditions to deliver the energy resources countless families and businesses rely on. 
as we work toward responsible legislation to protect these workers, we should strive to get it right, not simply get it done quickly. It is my hope we will join some of the legislative ideas discussed today with the eventual findings of the investigations underway to enact a law with a clearer focus on making mining safer. Our charge is not only to act, but to take action that will best protect miners. The legislation before this committee fails to do so, and I urge my colleagues to reject it, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, all members uh, 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 will, without objection, all members will, will may place opening statements in the, in the record at this point. The committee will now proceed for the consideration of, of the bill, H.R. 5663, and the clerk will designate the bill. H.R. 5663, <clears throat> the Minor Safety and Health Act of 2010. I ask unanimous consent to dispense with the reading of the bill without objection, so ordered. Hearing none. Uh, I now recognize myself to offer an amendment in the nature of a substitute. The amendment is at the desk and has been placed in your folders. Is that correct? That, this, uh, that it's in the members' folders. And the clerk will designate the amendment in the nature of a substitute. An amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 5663 offered by Mr. George Miller of California. The chair is recognized for five minutes. The amendment in the nature of a substitute clarifies and adjusts a number of provisions in the underlying bill. It reflects the comments and technical advice of a variety of stakeholders, including industry, labor, and the administration. As I mentioned in my opening statement, this legislation is a product of open and collaborative process. I am pleased that many took the opportunity to provide valuable assistance in shaping the substitute amendment. First, recognizing the key role that Senator Robert Byrd played in defending the interests of coal miners and given his personal involvement, in this legislation right up to the last week of his life, the bill is, will be renamed the Robert C. Byrd Minor Safety and Health Act. While his voice on behalf of coal miners is already missed, this legislation will honor his decades of advocacy on behalf of our nation's workers. Among other improvements, the, the amendments in the nature of a substitute clarifies the scope of the Secretary of Labor's subpoena authority. It removes the operator's requirement to report contractor injuries and illnesses at the mine site. Instead, contractors will report hours worked and injuries and illnesses for their employees specific to each mine where they are working. The substitute eliminates the underlying bill's provisions defining significant and substantial. Instead, the definition of of significant and substantial will continue to rely on case law. In addition, while determining whether to remove a mine from a, pat uh, from a pattern status, MSHA cannot penalize operators for imminent danger orders if the cause of the danger was beyond their control, provided there was no violation. Civil and criminal penalties of corporate officials will only apply when an operator's policies or practices result in violations rather than when they contribute to a violation. Criminal penalties for knowingly giving advance notice of a mine inspection will require the showing of intent to impede, interfere, or adversely affect an inspection. The substitute also adjusts the rule on payments to miners idled by MSHA's ordered mine closures. For example, while operators will still be required to pay minor, uh, miners when they preemptively close in advance of an anticipated MSHA order, they will be free of that obligation if they promptly withdraw miners upon discovering the hazard and making timely reports to MSHA. And instead of open-ended time period for payments, the substitute limits payments to a maximum of 60 days. The substitute also creates a two-tiered criminal enforcement regime. Knowing, knowing violations of mandatory health and safety standards will be considered a misdemeanor on the first offense and a felony on the second, thus retaining existing sanctions. However, knowingly committing a violation with knowledge that you are exposing minors to a significant risk of serious injury, illness, or death would be a felony on the first offense. Also, knowingly tampering with the disabling of a safety device, such as a methane detector, which exposed minors to a significant risk of serious injury, illness, or death will be a felony on the first offense. The substitute clarifies that the bill only applies to underground coal mines and underground gassy mines. With this substitute, the bill will not apply to sand and gravel, limestone, most minerals, cement, and surface coal mines. All of these mining industries will continue to be covered under the current Mine Act, and there will be no changes uh, to their regulations under this bill. Finally, the substitute reduces the burden of proof on employers to obtain a stay from the OSHA order to correct the hazard resulting from serious or willful violation. These and a number of other changes maintain the framework of the bill and the strength of its core provisions while addressing many of the concerns raised by industry, both coal and non metal and non-metal operators. I want to thank everybody who, 
who participated in the crafting of this amendment, and I urge its uh, adoption. And I recognize Mr. Klein. You want to be heard on the uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know some other members would like to uh, uh, address some uh, questions. Uh, we are still, frankly, digesting a little bit. I am wondering if the, uh, if the Chairman could uh, clarify a little bit of confusion we have here about which mines are covered uh, and now that we have the substitute out. It seemed uh, in, a, in a quick reading it looked like essentially we were down to uh, uh, perhaps coal mines and salt mines or something like that. Can you uh, tell us are, are open pit mines and, and aggregate mines and so forth no. not included? The, legisla stand? the legislation is uh, with, the, uh, with the amendment in nature substitute covers underground mining uh, coal mines and gaseous mines. Uh, the point being raised that in, in many of the other operations, you have neither fuel nor an ignition point uh, available in those uh, in those operations. That that deadly combination uh, is what uh, has led to so many of the catastrophes in the coal mining industry over over the uh, over the many years. The gaseous mine is a mine where there is, in fact, the presence of gas uh, in the mine. Uh, during the uh, during the uh, the mining operations that can either cause an explosion or a fire or the, or that kind of inherent danger uh, to the uh, to the miners, I believe that uh, uh, there's about 10 uh, gassy mines in the uh, uh, in the country, which would be salt uh, and I think Trona, uh, or, or is my understanding. Uh, okay, I uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm just then I'm looking at some list here again. We're trying to catch up just a little bit. So there are a number of mines um, that were on a list that you actually put out on April 14th uh, that have been subject to uh, tighter scrutiny under the pattern of violation list that would not be included now. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I understood that, and I know I will I will yield back my time because I know some of my colleagues have some questions. On the majority side, wish to be heard on this. Uh, who's Price. seeking recognition? Mr. Uh, Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow up a little bit on what um, our ranking member, Mr. Klein, talked about. I, 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 we had in our um, library of documents this, uh, this release that, that uh, you as chairman put out on April 14th that listed the number of mines that would have, uh, would have been cited. Um, and there's a uh, an array of oh I don't know 15 or 20 metal non-metal mines here. And uh, am I to understand that all of those who uh, on April 14th you believe Can we the would have been a, would have had a notice of uh, of uh, potential pattern violations, um, all of those will be exempt. The the mines that are not classified as gassy mines, the 10 mines, I believe the number is 10. Uh, will be included in the legislation. The non-gassy mines will, will continue under existing law in terms of patterns of violations. They'll, cons they'll continue with, with the existing regime. So it, 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 is that a yes, the, the, the metal, non-metal list? I have the list in front of me, but uh, there you go. Metal, metal non-metal mines that do not or are not gaseous mines will not be covered under, under the, this legislation. So then I'm to understand. I, my understanding is on the list you're looking at, there are no, there are no gassy mines. This, this is uh, mainly uh, cement and, and uh, some slate. So those were, those were mines uh, in, that I understand the list put, put forward by you, you and your office. Those were mines that had a potential pattern of violation and, and those won't be covered now. They will right? not be covered under under the amendments uh, to the act uh, encompassed by this bill. So the bill will will create special carve outs and different standards for some mines a, as opposed to other different standards of, of violation. The knowing standard then won't apply to these they other They will mines. operate under under the existing law. So we believe that 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 some mines ought to have a higher Level of because of the presence of both fuel and a source of ignition, that was the point made uh, uh, by the metal, non-metal people, and, and most of their mining operations, except for this small list of gases mine, don't have the presence of either fuel uh, or ignition as you have very often in a, in a, in a coal mine. So re reclaim my time. So it's my understanding that the majority party now believes that a standard for 
danger or threat to a minor's life in one setting and the level of liability for a mine in one setting should be completely different than a standard for a threat to a minor's life in another setting. Is that correct? When the threats are different. So whether, reclaim my time, so knowing that something is a, a uh, potential hazard in one instance is different than knowing that something is a potential hazard in another instance. I don't know what the something is, so. Well, nor, <laughs> the mil bill doesn't define that, so it, that, it, it's as nebulous as the bill. But that, my point is, Mr. Chairman, that what we are, what it appears what the, 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 uh, the manager's amendment does is to make it so that we are holding some businesses, some mining businesses, to one level of, stand, uh, of, of, of liability and standard, and others who, who may have the exact same kind of threat, although it may be under a different mechanism. No, it's not the same to, kind of threat. Reclaiming it's my not, time. It's not the same re kind of threat. Re reclaiming my time. Be accurate in your statement. Re it's not the same kind of threat. I'll reclaim my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The is welcome to. What the majority party is saying is that some miners, some mines, businesses, will be held to a different level of standard simply because of the, 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 the product that they are mining and the manner in which they mine it. Not that there are different threats, but they will be held to a different standard. Uh, this is a, a, a carve out, this is an exemption for, uh, uh, for folks, uh, and, and it further complicates the issue. Um, and uh, I would suggest, as, the, as Mr. Klein said, that uh, having gotten this less than 12 hours ago, um, that it would be most appropriate to uh, have the chairman step back, take a deep breath, uh, let's work together on an issue that ought not be uh, a partisan issue, um, and come up with a better bill. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Andrews. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Recognize the, five minutes. I, I support the, uh, the substitute and would respectfully uh, differ with what my friend from Georgia just said about it being, quote, the same threat. That's not the case. Uh, there are gradations in standards and penalties, not based upon the value of a miner's life. The reason we're doing this bill is because we care very much about the value of every miner's life. The difference in gradations and standards are based upon the difference in the presence or absence of combustibles and the method of mining which are more or less likely to create, create that combustion. It is frankly a common practice in safety regulations at the state and federal level in all industries to distinguish on the basis of the kind of activity going on. You know, a, a bank is subject to different kinds of safety regulations than an oil refinery because there's a different kind of activity going on. The basis that underlies the chairman's substitute here is a difference on the based upon the presence of combustibles and the type of activity that's going on that is more or less likely to ignite those combustibles and create a risk. So yes, there's difference in standards and difference in the way these are treated because there's a difference in, th in risk. And so frankly, the, uh, the statement that was made earlier about the risk being the same is not accurate. What would I, the gentleman yield? I would yield, yes. Yeah, I just, um, I, I think I do uh, understand we're talking about here there's a different threat because of the danger of explosion, for example, in a coal mine than there is in an open pit mine. My, my, I'm just trying to understand w what is included in the, in the differences between the two. So the example, what I'm trying to find out is if, for example, the whistleblower provisions, the whistleblower protections would not apply in, a, uh, in an aggregate mine, in an open mine, the same way they apply in a coal mine. Is that, is that, I'm just trying to understand what the legislation does. does it yes, uh, reclaiming my time, yes. There, there are different remedies, different standards. That is correct. Okay, and again, the, thank the, you. the basis for that distinction is the severity of the risk in the given situation, which is a common practice in the way people regulate and legislate. I think this is sound, and I think people should vote yes, and I yield back. Others who seek to uh, be heard on the uh, on the substitute, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yes, Chairman. Um, could you yield? Uh, oh, Mr. Wu. 
Uh, I'd like to just ask a question of the ranking member. Uh, would the ranking member feel better about the substitute if sand and gravel were included? Would the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. No, that's not the point, Mr. Well, I'm just trying to understand what the what the sub, what this is a change from where we have been before, and so we're trying to understand. Uh, my example was the whistleblower protections. Um, are they the same in a pit mine as they are in a coal mine? The answer is no. And so when we look at the the rest of the bill, and I'm not sure <coughs> about that yet, when we looked at the OSH Act changes, are are, are those affected? differently now. We're just trying to understand what the substitute which I, I, I understand. Came last reclaiming, night. reclaiming my time. Uh, if the gentleman would like to work on a modification to include sand and gravel, I would be open to that discussion with the gentleman. And I, I yield back to the chair. The gentleman, gentleman yields back. Uh, is there any further discussion? Without, a, without amendment, I mean, excuse me, without objection, the amendment in the nature of substitute will be considered as the base tech for the purpose of the amendment, and the amendment will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point, and any amendments to substitute shall be considered as read. Are there members who have an amendment to the uh, amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Mr. Gentlemen, Mr. Klein uh, has an amendment at the desk. The uh, clerk will designate the amendment, the staff will distribute the, uh, the amendment. Mr. Chairman, I would reserve a point and of Mr. order. Mr. Andrews reserves a, a point of order. Thank you. An amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 5663 offered by Mr. Klein of Minnesota. And the gentleman, uh, Mr. Klein, is recognized uh, for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for allowing me to describe what I believe is a far better approach to addressing the tragic explosion at the Upper Big Branch Mine and improve the safety of our nation's coal miners. Although we all wish it were possible, we cannot go back in time and prevent the Upper Big Branch tragedy. We cannot bring back the 29 miners lost that day, nor the 23 other miners who have lost their lives this year. But we can learn the lessons from these tragedies. The Mine Safety and Health Administration is currently conducting a comprehensive investigation into the Upper Big Branch tragedy. Likewise, the state of West Virginia and an independent panel of experts are in the midst of parallel investigations to determine what caused the fatal explosion in the Upper Big Branch mine and what steps could have been taken to prevent it. Unless we forget, an investigation into coal mining safety is currently underway right here in the Education Labor Committee. Chairman Miller took the extraordinary step of seeking and being granted deposition authority for the purpose of investigating the safety of underground coal mining. I consented to that request and my staff has been in regular contact with the majority as our investigation unfolds because I believe we cannot legislate without first understanding the problems we are attempting to solve. Not one of these investigations is complete, yet here we are today preparing to vote on more than 100 pages of changes to our mining laws and other workplace safety and health policies. Mr. Chairman, I wish we had all the information in hand to enact a bill today, but the reality is we do not. This rush to legislate is both self-imposed and ill-advised. We know the Senate has no intention of even introducing legislation until the fall. Moving a bill through this committee or the full U.S. House of Representatives before August will do nothing to speed the enactment of reform. The only thing this haste will accomplish is to limit our opportunity to legislate responsibility, responsibly. Waiting for the results of an investigation does not mean we sit idle. Republicans have already begun to develop a framework for legislative solutions based on the information currently available. We have identified a number of areas where Congress should consider taking action, and while additional reforms or different approaches may be necessary in the future, we believe this substitute is a more appropriate, immediate approach to enhancing mine safety. We developed this substitute by asking three fundamental questions. Are mining companies ignoring the law? Is MSHA failing to enforce the law? Is the law insufficient to protect minors? We believe the answers to each of these questions is in some measure yes. Cecil Roberts, the head of the United Mine Workers, has testified that 95 percent of mine operators are trying to do the right thing, but some small number of bad actors are flouting the law. This is unacceptable. The Department of Labor's Inspector General has confirmed what MSHA itself has told us. The agency has never enforced the law to its fullest extent. 
This, too, is unacceptable. Both of these breakdowns in the system must be addressed, but neither can be solved with legislation alone. Tougher laws do us no good if bad actors are permitted to flout the law and Federal authorities choose not to enforce it. Yet we know there are at least some changes to the law that could help. Current law does not reflect the latest scientific research. Tougher penalties can help deter violations, and changes to sharpen the tools in MSHA's toolbox can prod the agency to step up its enforcement. The Republican substitute concentrates its reforms in these three areas, responding to the three questions I posed earlier. Those areas are, one, empowering MSHA and holding the agency accountable, two, identifying and punishing bad actors, and three, modernizing mine safety standards. To empower MSHA and hold it accountable, we improve the pattern of violation structure to clearly identify perpetually unsafe mines and bring them into compliance through tougher enforcement. We grant the agency subpoena authority and we ensure an independent investigation of MSHA's actions in the wake of serious incidents. To punish bad actors, we increase penalties, both financial sanctions and jail time for willful violations of the law. And because tipping off mine personnel in advance of an inspection undermines the most basic purpose of safety inspections, we create special penalties for anyone who provides advance notice with the intent of interfering with an inspection. Finally, to modernize mine safety standards, we use the latest scientific recommendations for rock dusting. This includes robust field testing of its explosivity meters so we can eventually provide for real-time monitoring of the risk of explosion. Likewise, we ensure a standard is finally put forward for personal dust monitors, a tool that helps miners identify and mitigate hazards that can lead to long-term health problems. The Republican substitute includes other common sense changes, including a study of whether mine safety experts currently spread among various federal agencies ought to be brought together in a single agency to improve information sharing. If this committee insists on legislating without the relevant information, I hope we, we pursue the responsible approach outlined in the Repub Republican substitute. This amendment offers focused reforms that address specific mine safety concerns, concerns that are more clearly understood and are shared by members on both sides of the aisle and on which common ground can be found. I urge my colleagues to support this sensible alternative, and I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, and the chair will recognize himself. Uh, I'll sound like you at the outset, having just seen this amendment. <laughs> There's humor in this, folks. Get a little, a little levity out there. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a couple of a couple of points uh, that uh, on the on the pattern of violation, as I understand the amendment, you basically adopt the provisions of what uh, uh, Professor uh, Grayson uh, talked to the committee about the other day. <coughs> Certainly, compared to the existing system, I'm a fan of the approach that he's taking, but to adopt that in its entirety and decide that that's going to be the system I think is too restrictive. We've talked with the department. I would encourage the department to pursue uh, something along those lines with the involvement of, uh, of uh, Professor Grayson. But I don't think that you want to have that one formula sort of fit the entire mining and industry. Uh, that's what you guys would call one size fits all. Uh, I, I don't, again, I, I think what he laid out in his testimony and the, and the research that he's done is very, very valuable in trying to establish the norms of what, what's acceptable and what isn't and a way that that can constantly be updated given whatever happens in terms of violations and, and the operations of, of the mine. But I don't think it should be adopted in its entirety as, as that's, the, that's the only way to, to, uh, to do it. Uh, uh, I'm also concerned that, that, that uh, when, when mines are closed for violations by the companies, that, that uh, there's no entitlement here that miners be paid uh, while, that, while, that, uh, while that mine is closed. That, that obviously is a disincentive for miners uh, raising the issue of, of safety, uh, and it, it's in our, in our legislation. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the whistleblower protection, of course, I think is, is, is very important to, to coal miners. Uh, we heard that testimony in Beckley and, and here again in, in, uh, in Washington, and you also, of course, strike the, uh, the OSHA provisions that I think are very, very important uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this legislation and, and to workers, and I would hope that the members would, uh, 
uh, would, would uh, not support this, uh, this amendment. The others who seek to be heard on the, uh, on the substitute, if, if not. Chairman? Yes, uh, Ms. Wolsey. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. I'd like to just point out that the manager's amendment uh, to H.R. 5663 requires that contractors uh, report injuries and illnesses uh, on a mine-by-mine -mine basis so miners and MSHA uh, can get a really accurate picture of the mine safety record and to quickly address hazards. The uh, substitute, however, uh, limits the useful, this uh, useful information and uh, that mine operators and contractors uh, would have to report to MSHA. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, I, I believe that uh, what the, uh, the, my, the manager's amendment puts forth is what we need in the 21st century, and we've learned that. So I, this, this substitute would cut that out, which is one more reason not to support the substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to focus specifically on one issue contained in the, uh, in the substitute dealing with pre-conference issues. And this was a practice successfully used by MSHA and the mining industry for years, which gave operators the opportunity to meet with MSHA prior to the assessment of civil penalties. These pre-contest conferences were used to discuss and resolve disputes over violations. Because of the collaborative nature of these conferences, the process allowed the mine operator to avoid filing a penalty contest if both sides were satisfied with the result of the conference. Unfortunately, beginning in 2008, the pre-contest conferences were phased out. Operators may still request a conference, but not until after the operator has formally contested the penalty. And one of the issues that we have seen, as we all understand, is the backlog of cases that are being appealed. Uh, this would be an issue that directly uh, could have been resolved if this hadn't been phased out in 2008. MSHA has cited this as one of the factors contributing to the significant penalty contest backlog the agency now faces. And in his testimony uh, in February, Assistant Secretary Maine, before this committee, agreed to retool the process as one of the ways to reduce the number of contests. I support restoring the pre-contest conferences. We all agree that we must use every tool at our disposal to reduce the backlog at MSHA, but I also believe the federal government and the industry need to do more to work together to make workplaces safer. A criticism that we all hear, as I said, is the current system is too punitive and does not incentivize collaboration. The pre-contest conference is a process that both the agency and the industry agree lessened the contest burden. MSHA is currently finalizing the details on a pilot program it intends to roll out next month in August to bring back the pre-contest conferences. I strongly encourage the agency to keep to this timeline and move as quickly to launch the program nationwide as quickly as possible, and it's because of that program being underway and hopefully offered next month that I did not offer an amendment that I plan to offer restoring pre-contest conferences. So I'm hopeful that we will see the results of that beginning next month. Would, would the gentleman yield? I would. Uh, I want to thank him for his comments, and he's exactly correct. Uh, that's an integral part of the substitute to go directly at that issue because we have heard in testimony here from Assistant Secretary Maine and others that the breakdown of that conference process has been very harmful. And so the language for all members in our substitute uh, repeals the uh, the pills, the procedure interview letters, and gets back to that conferencing process so they have a chance to work these things out. We think it's an important part. And and responding for just a minute to Ms. Woolsey, our substitute is, net, I think, appropriately more tightly focused, and that's a, one of the reasons that I'm asking members to support it. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman from yielding. 
I thank the gentleman. And again, I, I saw that as a weakness in the underlying bill as well and I declined to offer the amendment because I do have some optimism. In August, we're going to see a result from MSHA. It's imperative that we make clearing the backlog a priority because while the investigation at Upper Big Branch is ongoing, it's abundantly clear that the backlog of appeals is a huge problem and a contributing factor to the lax enforcement and unsafe conditions in our nation's minds. I look forward to continuing to monitor the implementation of this program and working with MSHA, the chairman and other members of the committee to expand the program once we see the results of the pilot. I thank the chairman for the time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. McKeon. Mr. Chairman, I, I think that uh, little discussion that we just had, I think, is, uh, is something that we should have a lot more of. I think the history of this committee has been going, at least to the time I've been in, in Congress, has been fairly partisan committee. I think people in the Congress understand this is a partisan committee. I think it's become uh, better so far as personal attacks. You know, we've, we've gotten, I think we've made a lot of improvement in that in the last several years. But I think um, since the uh, majority became the majority, I remember that contest in 2006. There was a lot of discussion about doing things in a more transparent way, about following regular order. And to my uh, recollection, uh, since that change uh, in that after the election of 2006, we've, we really haven't been transparent. We really haven't been uh, following regular order. I, I don't remember uh, since then that we've had a markup at a subcommittee level. Everything goes full committee, and you have the votes. I mean, there's no, there's no question. We know that when we walk in here where the votes are. Uh, but I, I think that really gives you a little more responsibility to listen to us for good ideas. Because when we have worked together in the past, we come out with a better product. You know, in 2006, when we passed the Minor Safety Act and it became law, the final vote on the floor was 381 to 37. The votes in favor included 219 Republicans, 161 Democrats, and one Independent. Four Republicans, 33 Democrats voted against it. That bill became law for the first uh, change in minor safety since 1977. And, and I think it made some very good progress in minor safety. Now, now should it be improved? I think probably most of us agree that it, that it should. But, but this bill has been one, again, that's done totally by the majority. Uh, we know it'll be a, a party line vote. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's the way it's gonna be because we have not been included in it. The Senate, uh, has not done anything. They haven't introduced a bill yet. We have something like 24, 25 legislative days. So the chance of this bill becoming law uh, is, is very, very slight. And, and yet we rush uh, changes through last night in the middle of the night that we're trying to figure out what they are right now. And I just, I, I think it really would be better for the country, better for the Congress if we did made more of an attempt to try to work together because at the end of the day, all of us, all of us believe in whatever we can do to improve minor safety. And there are uh, some people on this side of the aisle that have some good ideas that could add to the debate if we had just a little bit more openness, like the last little discussion we had. And uh, I guess that, uh, I, I know where the votes are. I know we'll rush this through, and I, we may even get it to the floor before this. We leave uh, uh, during this Congress, but it's not going to be law, and it's not going to do anything to promote further minor safety. And I think that we're missing an opportunity to try to do that. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Chairman leads, yields back his time. The chair will respond. Uh, obviously, there's a sense of urgency about this bill given uh, what happens in the, in the nation's minds. Uh, this committee is not going to set its markup schedule based upon the whims of the Senate that change every day. 
that would be impossible for us to do that. We know uh, their problems, they're legion, uh, and they're almost in, intractable. Uh, this, this bill uh, was, the text of this bill was distributed to the minority on June 29th. The bill was introduced on July 1st. The, the, uh, at each one of these stages, we invited the minority to participate uh, in, the, in the discussions on the draft and the language of the, uh, of the bill. The hearing was held on July 13th. The substitute was circulated on Monday. There's no requirement of that. We've again asked for participation and comments. They have not been forthcoming. Uh, and the uh, second substitute was introduced last night with a five sentence change, which was to take out uh, 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 the, the uh, non metal metal sector, but for the uh, above ground, uh, above, except for the uh, gaseous uh, mines. Uh, the minority is, is, is perfectly free to make whatever determinations they want. Uh, about participation, and I understand that, and we, we did it when we were, were in the minority, and, and, and that's, a ba that's a back and forth. Uh, but we have tried in every effort to, to extend that, oppor that opportunity to do that. And, and in many legislation, uh, we will, you know, I've sort of picked up after uh, serving under, under uh, uh, Congressman Banner was, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll We'll talk at the beginning and see where people are going to go and what they go. And if it can't be bipartisan, it can't be bipartisan. But we have work to do, and uh, and that worked reasonably well. I think it continues to work reasonably well uh, in this uh, in this committee. There is not an effort here to to, to shut uh, to shut people out. Uh, that's not that's not what I do. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, we are where we are because we haven't we haven't had those suggestions. Uh, for those uh, for those those changes, I assume there'll be additional amendments uh, offered, uh, and we'll we'll consider each one of them on their uh, uh, on their merits and and uh, you know with the intent of what we're trying to trying to do in this uh, in this legislation, and we'll uh, continue to uh, uh, to proceed. But there's you know there's uh, well that's it. Thank you. Did you seek to be recognized? I did, Mr. On, the, uh, on the uh, on the client uh, substitute, yes, Mr. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, first of all, I just want to um, agree with your your remarks and also add for the record that the subcommittee uh, held a hearing in Connecticut about three four weeks ago uh, in response to a, an explosion in a natural gas plant, uh, which again there's full record, which is part of the committee's uh, proceedings, which described that uh, on February 7th uh, a, a natural gas plant that was under construction used procedures which the manufacturers of the turbines uh, recommended should not be used to blow the gas pipelines. We had testimony from one of the widows of the six uh, workers who lost their lives as a result of that um, explosion, which was bone chilling, uh, because they described uh, the workers going to work that morning full of fear and apprehension about the fact that this procedure was being followed that there was no effort to um, uh, remove non-related workers who were not involved in the pipe cleaning operation uh, from being within the, the radius of where uh, an explosion occurred. Uh, again, what the widow who testified, uh, husband, had absolutely nothing to do with the gas blow procedure that was taking place. He didn't belong there. Uh, and his brother submitted written testimony about the fact that, uh, again, that uh, Ronnie Crabb, the decedent, um, was fearful of his own life. Section 7. Uh, uh, Title VII of this uh, bill, which was again part of the legislation from day one, would have given workers like Ronnie Crabb the opportunity to, to um, uh, under the whistleblower protections, to not participate in a procedure which again the manufacturers, General Electric and Siemens, which produce these gas turbines, say that the procedure that was employed that morning that unfortunately resulted in six workers losing their lives um, should not have taken place and would have given them an opportunity, a legal safe harbor, uh, where they would not have uh, to, to participate in that procedure. The substitute which uh, the gentleman uh, has offered would strip uh, that section uh, from this bill. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, the subcommittee did its job by going out and, and uh, getting facts in terms of uh, a huge gap that exists in OSHA. Uh, this legislation would fill that gap and, again, provide basic protection for workers who are involved in procedures that they know could end up with serious injury or loss of life. And um, as far as I'm concerned, that's doing our job as far as uh, passing this uh, 
the file copy and the, and the chairman's substitute. And uh, I would Would the gentleman to... yield? Sure. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for yielding for, and for his comments. And I do understand that that uh, there was a field hearing in your in your backyards, a little out of reach for many members. Uh, it wasn't uh, there wasn't bipartisan uh, participation in that. But I I do appreciate that you were looking for information. Um, but w we really believe that we ought to be I, focusing on well, on minor staff. safety. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's your time. It's your time. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I'm just. I'm, I thought you were talking about my substitute, and I'm trying to explain that we believe it's important to focus on minor safety when we're doing a Mine Safety Act, and we we'll, can take up the OSH Act in, in other legislation. But this base bill has a huge reach into every grocery store, hardware store, manufacturing plant in America, and, and it seems to us that we ought to be focusing on minor safety in, in this bill, and that's the reason that there is no uh, provision in, in the substitute as there is in the base bill that has this gigantic expansion uh, of the OSH Act. And I yield back. Just for the record, at that hearing, uh, minority staff uh, participated in, in the proceedings. Uh, any member on your side was welcome uh, to, to Connecticut, and we would have been glad to, to have them there. And, and again, there's a record which was generated as a result of that, which is part of the full committee's proceedings. No. It was not a partisan event. And what, what I would just simply say is that um, this section of the bill has been there from day one, uh, and it recognizes that there is a huge gap in existing OSHA law which unfortunately leaves workers in a completely impossible position when, when workplace uh, processes are occurring, even against manufacturers' recommendations, uh, and they have no choice but to, to be in a place where they know in their heart um, it is not safe. And, and we, again, have full record which demonstrates that, and that's why I think this substitute uh, falls short in terms of what I think is a bipartisan goal and mission to protect America's workers. And I yield back. The gentleman Lee yields back. Mr. Guthrie seeks recognition on the, uh, on the substitute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, that exchange just uh, kind of did my comments. So I won't be long, but uh, m my point on this, the first six sections titles are for miners, and now it's restricted now to underground gaseous mines. And I just want to make sure we understand that Title VII, as it's just been described, does expand. The bill does have broader expanse than just underground mines through Title VII. So I just want to bring in, in the the amendment that we're talking about, which should be discussed, and I agree, we need to discuss and look at OSHA probably in a separate bill, but this for minor safety bill, this Klein amendment, the, the, the ranking member's amendment, focuses on mine safety only, doesn't expand it economy-wide. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. So, uh, the question comes on. Mr. Chairman, I withdraw my point of order. Mr. Andrews withdraws his point of order. The question comes on the amendment in nature substitute offered by uh, Congressman Klein, all those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. And the gentleman requests a roll call. Uh, we will, uh, under agreement to the chair and the ranking member, we will uh, postpone the roll calls until a time certain. There may be some complications because members are, are we don't know how long the, the signing of the financial reform bill is, is going to take. Uh, uh, whether we'll be done before they're back or whatever, but we'll, we'll set a time certain for the, for the vote. Uh, the chair recognizes Ms. Shea Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would also like to thank your staff for working with me on this amendment. We've had a number of hearings wait, wait, now. Wait, wait, let us oh, designate sorry. the amendment. You're, 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 you're offering an amendment, correct? Yes. Yes, the, the clerk will designate the amendment by the, the gentlewoman, amendment. and the staff will distribute the amendment. An amendment offered by Ms. Shea Porter of New Hampshire. Just give us some. Mr. Klein reserves a, a point of order, and uh, just give us a minute to get it distributed. The gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you. We've had a number of hearings now where we have heard family members describe the tragic loss of their loved ones. We've heard that in most of these situations, the miners and their family members were aware of the looming dangers in the mines, but a culture of fear and intimidation prevented anyone from coming forward. In a field hearing in Beckley, West Virginia, we heard from Mr. Steve Morgan, who lost his 21-year-old son, Adam Morgan, at the Upper Big Branch Mine his 21-year-old son, who upon going to his boss to raise safety concerns was told that, quote, 
If he was scared, he needed to rethink his career. So Adam went back to work. He went back to work, and his father came before this committee to explain how he didn't come home. Enough is enough. Where does the minor turn if he works in a mine that views a report about safety issues as really just an issue of a minor lacking courage? We know all too well the courage that's required to come forward, and that safety isn't a matter of being scared. For these minors, it's truly a matter of life and death. My amendment will ensure that in these situations, minors will have a number to call where they can report safety concerns, even if their employer has chosen to mock or ignore their concerns. My amendment codifies the hazard reporting hotline and the distribution of wallet card type materials containing the hotline phone number and the web address. Additionally, it would add to the new refresher training on minor rights and responsibilities established by the base bill by requiring that these materials be distributed as part of their annual training. After all of the testimony we have heard, we know that it is unrealistic to expect a concerned minor to stand in front of a poster board in the workplace in order to write down the whistleblower hotline number. In minds where a culture of fear and intimidation prevail, we must do what we can to empower minors to be the best advocates for their own safety and to help them do so in an anonymous manner without fear of retaliation. My amendment is not a silver bullet, but it is another tool that these minors can draw upon to keep themselves safe and to help ensure that they come home at the end of their shift. I urge my colleagues to support my amendment. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership in standing with our nation's minors, and I yield back. The, the gentlewoman yields back her time. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> As I understand uh, the general lady's amendment, uh, what we're doing here is uh, we're creating a wallet card. Um, we, we already have the toll-free hotline. There's information posted on the bulletin boards, as she indicated, uh, that is available in every <coughs> every mine and mining location. And so the the really bottom line of the amendment is to add a wallet card. Uh, I suppose wallet cards are useful. We're not going to oppose the uh, the amendment. I yield back. Gentlemen, is back with further discussion on this amendment. If not, the question comes on the amendment by, by the gentlewoman. All those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. You have an amendment on your side? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Ms. McMorris Rogers is recognized. Uh, uh, but when will the clerk will designate the amendment? The staff. Mr. Chairman, I reserve a point of order against Mr. You. Andrews reserves a point of order. An amendment offered by Mrs. McMorris Rogers of Washington. Just to strike the ocean. Yeah. And the uh, it's not complicated. So the gentleman, <laughs> the, the gentlewoman, <laughs> the gentlewoman is recognized uh, for five minutes to explain her amendment. Thank you, Mr. Amendment, this, or Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, this amendment. Yes, I prefer is, the formal this title. Is a, <laughs> this is a pretty simple amendment. It, it proposes to strike Section 7 from the bill. As I stated at last week's hearing, everyone is committed to the safety of our minors and of employees everywhere. The risks that many employees take on a, on a daily basis are unthinkable to many of us, and we owe it to them, and employers owe it to them, to ensure that they're working in the safest environment possible. Bad actors need to be weeded out and held accountable. Yet I'm concerned that the bill we're considering today overreaches. It overreaches as it relates to our mining laws. Just four years ago, Congress passed the Miners Act, which among other things, enhanced the penalties, improved technology, as well as increasing funding for the Miner Safety and Health Administration. Today, we're going to increase penalties again, but without the benefit of knowing whether increased penalties are necessary to make our miners safe safer. But my real concerns rest with Title VII of the bill and the proposed changes to OSHA. If implemented, these sweeping changes to OSHA will negatively impact every employer in the nation, as the cost to do business in this country will increase substantially. The amendment I'm offering today strikes Title VII, keeping H.R. 5663 focused on what it purports to do address mine safety. Not only is this the wrong time to increase the threat of litigation that businesses already experience by lowering the liability standard, imposing vague new standards and harsh penalties, but these changes do little to improve worker safety or prevent accidents. In fact, a GAO study released last fall recommended that OSHA increase its educational outreach to 
to employers to help them better understand workplace injuries and illnesses and mechanisms to track them. The rate of workplace injuries and illnesses has declined since 1992, and it's declined under policies that balance compliance assistance with enforcement. This includes working with states to ensure that state plans reflect these balances. But the bill we're considering today shifts these collaborative approaches in favor of stricter enforcement and harsher penalties and eliminates the abilities of states to establish their own models, plans that in include increased inspections, enhanced flexibility, and greater access to innovative strategies for making job sites safer. At a time when jobs are scarce and the economy is fragile, we need to do all we can to employ policies to encourage economic expansion, not take away from scarce resources take away scarce resources from safety, to, uh, from safety and put it towards litigation, higher cost, and more regulation. I urge my colleagues to support this amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman yields back the balance of her time. Ms. Woolsey, recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Was recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, indeed, uh, the uh, PAWA section, Title VII of uh, H.R. 5663, adopts uh, absolutely essential provisions of the Protecting Workers, America's Workers Act. Uh, it makes very important changes to the Occupational and Safety Act, the OSHA, OSHA Act, uh, because the OSHA Act has not been significantly amended since it was passed 40 years ago. The OSHA provisions in today's bill brings uh, that agency into the 21st century. It gives it critical tools that are needed to fulfill its mission to keep workers safe. And among other important provisions, the substitute uh, and, and the Title VII strengthens uh, whistleblower laws to protect those workers and minors who speak out about unsafe conditions. Since inspectors can't be uh, every, at every workplace uh, every minute, we must depend on minors and other workers to be vigilant, and we must make it safe and uh, not set up some situation where they'll lose their job if, or otherwise be retaliated against if they call uh, issues to our attention and, emerge and uh, unsafe conditions. So um, I, I, I recommend that we uh, include these protections in the substitute, that we keep Title VII uh, in total, that we acknowledge that it is just as important to uh, protect our workers as it is to protect elephants and fish and uh, birds, and that the penalties should be uh, at least as much or more, and um, that the uh, substitute adopt title include in, uh, contain uh, the entirety of of. Uh, Title VII in the bill, and that we update criminal and civil penalties, that uh, family uh, involvement provisions be included, that uh, abatement during contests uh, that are already in the Mine Act be honored, and that uh, we make this the best, strongest bill we can because the 21st century is here. Uh, we are talking about 40-year-old uh, legislation and, and uh, programs that should have been updated a long time ago. And you know, I'd be very curious if my ranking member on the Workforce Protection Subcommittee would vote for H.R. 5663 with the removal of Title VII. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Who wishes to be heard on this? Yes, Mr. Oh. Rowe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's recognized uh, for five minutes. Thank you. Um, I think we are, I spent a good bit of time last night and this morning reading, rereading, and, and, and getting in the weeds with this bill, and it looks like there are two, two basic separate issues. We want, I mean, there's not anyone sitting at this diocese here who doesn't want minor safety. That, that is absolutely number one. And number two, the OSHA, the changes in OSHA, I think these should definitely be two separate issues. And I'm not going to speak to the minor safety issue right now. I'm going to speak to the OSHA issue that got the amendment that's, that's on the table at the desk. Having dealt with OSHA as an employer for the last 30-plus years, uh, I look at these, um, these really 
incredibly onerous fines and i'll just point out to you a couple of things that have happened to me personally as an employer um, in a medical office uh, we had an osha fine for placing uh, medications that we were going to give to a homeless clinic we do this uh, monthly when medications get close to their expiration date we send them to a homeless clinic and we were fined for putting this uh, medication in the wrong color bag uh, it was an $1,800 fine. I said, let no good deed go unpunished. I don't know how much I could get punished by looking at this new regulation. It could be in the tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, number two, we, we didn't have a letter in one particular OSHA violation about an amniocentesis needle, which is a spinal needle that doesn't have a protective cap. There is not one in the universe. They don't make one. But we didn't have a letter in our file saying you, that they didn't make one. And so, therefore, that was a $1,700 fine. And it could have been a $60,000 or now a $120,000 fine. I don't know whether I could go to jail for something like that or not. That has nothing to do with safety of anybody. And the question I have also is that do these OSHA inspectors get a bonus for fines that they give out? Or are they expected to bring in so much money? Because there are rules out there in OSHA you cannot follow. And I'll give you another example. A handrail in a handicap, uh, uh, in a handicap bathroom. One inspector came in and said it's in the wrong position, so the hospital moved it to a higher position. A second inspector came in and said, "No, it's in the wrong position. You got to move it back down where it was." And that would be funny, except it costs money to business to do that. Several hundred dollars, or maybe a thousand. I don't know how much it costs to get it up and down. And I suggested maybe what we should do is just put a bracket, and when one inspector came, we'd put it here. When the other inspector came, we'd put it here. Um, and this has nothing to do with worker safety. Obviously, everybody here wants the miners to be safe. So I think there are two very different issues we're talking about. And these OSHA uh, uh, regulations really are are expanded tremendously. Now, if they haven't been looked at in 40 years, I think we should, but in a much more diligent uh, way. The other thing, and I'm not an attorney, Mr. Chairman, and I would like someone to help me with this because I, I tried to get the difference between knowing and willing. And one of the things that really bothers me here is that H.R. Uh, 5663 would create new civil and criminal liability for individuals, directors, or corporate officers, including H.R. managers, and these provisions require new and vague standards for criminal liability, including felony criminal sanctions against any company officer director for knowing violations of the OSHA Act. What is the difference between knowing and willing? Could, could mm. someone help me with that? I, I yield. Uh, I would first. I would. Is the gentleman yielding his time? I yield. Yes, to Mr. Andrews. I, I'm going. There'll be no hourly fee for this consultation, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Take a note. <laughs> The, um, here's my understanding of that. I think it's a very important distinction. Let's say there's a rule that says that you have to have um, controls on a certain poisonous gas from going into a work area. And in the first instance, the employer uh, just doesn't inspect it very often and doesn't look at it very carefully and, and carelessly, negligently, the gas comes into the room and hurts somebody. That's not a knowing violation. Second example, the employer says, you know, the guy working in there today, I really can't stand this guy. He, I, I really hope he gets sick. And he, he intentionally turns the valve on so the guy gets sick. That's willful. Third example that's knowing is that, you know, the, the employer's safety inspector comes up and says, that valve isn't working properly. And they have another safety inspector look and say, yeah, it's not working properly. It might leak today. And the employer doesn't fix it. Someone goes into the room and gets injured or sickened by the poison gas. That's knowing. So if you have actual knowledge of a fact that could hurt someone and don't do something about it, that's knowing. It's not willful, but it's knowing. I think most of us think that in that situation, if you knew that the risk was there and you had a chance to do something about it, that's a pretty serious violation. But, uh, I, I guess my time has expired. Would you I yield? Guess. Or, uh, could you have time to yield? It's up to the yeah, I'll, I'll yield. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd yield. Like, like to point out to the gentleman that there's nothing in this bill that uh, takes away OSHA's uh, discretion to negotiate with uh, the employer regarding penalties. It's, I mean, there will still be discussion in, uh, in protecting that one other piece of that is in protecting 
uh, employees, uh, you save a lot on your workers' comp costs also. So it, everybody comes out better by uh, doing the right thing. Re reclaiming my time, I don't know that everybody comes out better, and I don't know that what I saw protected any worker safety. I'll yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. Mr. Hare, recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, as my, as my friend from California has pointed out, it's been 40 years since this issue has been addressed, and I find it interesting that there are stronger criminal penalties for harassing a wild horse or a burro on public land than there are for people that, that work. I came out of a clothing factory, as most of you know, 53 cutters, and three of us got out without all 10 fingers. In my 14 years, we had two OSHA inspections that lasted a grand total of about 18 minutes each. Um, there are 9 million workplaces within this jurisdiction. Now, I will say to my friend, I'm, I, I'm not saying that every time they get it right, but the fact of the matter remains, we have workers out there. Uh, if you look, we've had hearings on CentOS. They are without a doubt the number one corporate bad guy around here. They pay the fines and a guy dies and they tell the wife that your husband was too stupid to operate the equipment of which I find insulting. But that plant had been inspected. They get fined, they pay the fines. I don't know what dollar amount you can put on somebody being killed or maimed, but the point here is, when we haven't visited this issue for 40 years, when animals get, you can be fined more for, for messing with a, a, a donkey than you can a person in a factory, I find that to be in, incredible. With regard to the, the, the gentle lady's comments about the expenses, workplace illnesses and injuries are expensive. They, they currently spend about 156 to $312 billion a year in direct and indirect workman's compensation losses. And I will tell you, I believe that the vast majority of businesses want to do the right thing. I do. I think they want to keep their people safe. The problem that we run into is we have businesses that, that, will, that prefer to pay the fine if they even get inspected. And when they get inspected, sometimes it's in such a big rush that they don't even notice the real problems that are there. And at the end of the day, <coughs> whether you, and I agree with you, everybody here wants to see minors safe. But whether it's in Mr. Courtney's district or in my district or any, anybody's district, a worker just deserves the fundamental right to be able to go to work, put in a, a, a day, and come home and be safe with their family. And if we have a position and, and something that will help strengthen that ability for that person, and I think we should look at, at, at overstepping boundaries if they're there. I certainly do. But to not to say that, well, well, we'll deal with it separately, I don't know when because it's been 40 years, and I don't know if not now when, and if not us, who. So I just want to see us, I think that with all due respect, I oppose the amendment. I want to see workers stay safe. I know we all do. but. For heaven's sakes, I just think that when we take a look at this, I don't think any of us can, can really, with a straight face, believe that OSHA has the resources to do the kinds of inspections that they need to do to keep our workers safe. And I just absolutely think that we can do much better. And I hope this amendment uh, fails so that we want to err on the side of working people. And I just want them to be able to go home, no matter what they do for a living, to be safe with their families. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back his time. So does he seek to respond? If, Mr. if Tom, not, are you seeking time? Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, was recognized for five minutes. I appreciate that. I mean, this is a. Um, I I, su I support the, the general lady's amendment. Uh, you know, I think we're we're doing a disservice both to uh, minors by diluting, focusing on minor safety, but I think we're also doing a disservice to. Uh, the rest of American workers by rushing and combining this this OSHA uh, remake um, tremendously. I, I think it deserves to, that we do our due diligence on that side and, and look at it. I, you know, I uh, I had um, I had heard somebody talk about how we have OSHA has discretion on penalties. Um, you know, I I, I would argue uh, against that. Actually, I have a number of constituents I've been working with on OSHA issues. We've elevated them. OSHA has come into my office where uh, these businesses, these employers uh, have had, uh, you know, unannounced visits and concerns. 
And in the end, uh, when they've tried to, uh, uh, when uh, fines have been levied for things that just, uh, I would argue, were inappropriate, and I won't, we, uh, if we have, uh, if we actually do the right thing and separate this out and, and do subcommittee hearings and hearings on OSHA, that would be a great place to flush that out. Um, in the end, when they sat down with the, uh, the person who, uh, who the inspector was there, the inspector, you know, no shortage of what I would call intimidation. Where, where the, the, uh, these uh, business owners um, address the issue of, well, you know, what can I do to appeal this? What can I do to, uh, to take this further? Because uh, obviously they didn't agree with what the, what the, what the on-site findings were. Essentially, we're told, well, you know what, you don't want to do that because if you do, the penalties will be more severe. I mean, that's, that's a program that's out of control. Uh, we need OSHA to protect workers, but we have to do it in a balanced way that protects the workforce uh, as well, uh, those jobs. And so I, I think we're doing, this is just a, I, I support the General Ladies Amendment. I think this is, a, it's a disservice to uh, uh, not to strike this section from this and do our due diligence in the right kind of way, follow proper procedure, the subcommittee, and really focus on OSHA. We, we've got a lot we could talk about with it, and rushing it through this morning isn't the way to do Will it. Will the gentleman I yield? I uh, yield. H would anyone answer, and the question didn't get answered a moment ago, when I answered, are there any um, uh, bonuses or are the OSHA inspectors encouraged to find so much money? Does anyone, are they pressured? I'm not necessarily, they may not want to, but are they pressured to do that? And I totally agree with you. When, when you bring in a fine of a certain amount, you're much smarter just to pay the fine. Will the gentleman yield? To, uh, yes, I'll yield. The answer to your question is no. There, there are no such bonuses. And I'll reclaim my time, are there any pressure on these folks to, to do this? Because I, I can tell you as an employer, there certainly is, is pressure to pay the fine and not to appeal it because uh, it would cost you more to do that. And, and I, this, I could go on with many, many more examples. And it's not, and these things, if they had something to do with worker safety, and I appreciate what the gentlelady from California is, is trying to do. I think everyone here, again, want to focus on the number one issue today before us should be minor safety and and that's what I think our objection has been we're bringing something else into this bill that that may do not directly and also affects a lot of other businesses not just the mining business I yield back yields back his time mr. chairman mr. Andrews mr. Wu then mr. Wu are you seeking recognition okay mr. Andrews first I'd like to withdraw my point of order against the amendment um, second I uh, to this notion that this is being rushed through, uh, our preliminary evaluation in the last two Congresses between the subject of minor safety and general OSHA safety, there have been 24 hearings in the last two Congresses. Um, I think the record will show there's been participation by both sides of the aisle. Of course, there's always an opportunity for participation by both sides of the aisle. So on 24 occasions, a committee of the Congress in the last two Congresses met to consider issues concerning worker safety with respect to mines and with respect to OSHA uh, more generally. I want to come back to a point my friend from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney, made a few minutes ago in the context of the ranking member's remarks where he said that this uh, section of the bill invokes, quote, radical changes in the OSHA law. I want to talk about one of the, what one of those changes in, and, and we can all be the judge of whether it's radical or not. Mr. Courtney tells the story that uh, was uh, evoked from the field hearing that took place in Connecticut about a worker who, who says to his wife and apparently some other people, there's going to be a procedure done today at work that I don't think is safe, and I'm worried I might not come home. He goes to work. It turns out that the procedure is specifically contradictory to what the manufacturer of this system recommends. The employer does the procedure anyway, and he and I believe it's five others die as a result of this happening. Now, do you or do you not think that that person should have had the right to say, I'm going to report the fact that I think this is unsafe for me and my fellow workers, and I'm not going to do it because I don't want to put my life on the line. And if he turns out to be right, to be in a position where he can't be punished or have his job taken away. 
Under present law, he, for all intents and purposes, does not have that right. It doesn't work. So his choice was give up his livelihood or risk his life. The provisions in this bill, which the General Lays Amendment would strike, give him a more reasonable and fair choice. It says to him that if he says, I'm going to blow the whistle on this, call it as I see it because I don't think this is safe, refuses to do the procedure, if he is right, if he is right, then his job is protected, his income is protected, and he does not lose his life. I don't think that's radical. I really don't. And I think another procedure that's being struck here that says that after this accident occurs, this tragedy occurs, that before there's any public discussion of what's going to happen with charges, his family has the right to be consulted about what's going on, which he doesn't now. I don't think that's radical. I think that if you lost your mother or your father or your son or your daughter at a workplace incident, and you want to find out what the investigation showed, and you want to be sure that there's a real diligent effort to find out whether something wrong was done, you have the right to be consulted about that. You know, we have victims' witness units in prosecutors' offices all over this country where the victims of crime are brought in and briefed on a prosecution within the bounds of the law so they can be respected so they can know what happened to their loved one. Should, that, should some lesser standard apply where someone gets blown up and, and killed by a gas explosion, their family feels about this? I don't think so. I certainly don't think it's radical to do that. Another provision in here says that if there's a willful violation, again, go back to what I said to Dr. Rowe, someone says, you know, I want to do this on purpose. And then the employer appeals that. During the pendency of the appeal, the employer can be told to fix the violation so it doesn't happen again during the pendency of the appeal. I don't think that's radical. I think that protects people. So if you think those things are radical, you should vote for the amendment. But if you think that they make common sense, I think you should vote against it. I would urge Will the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield. A moment ago to Dr. Rowe, you, uh, you gave your definition of the terms to which he asked. It was your legal opinion. You did not charge us. I appreciate that. And I will not say anything snarky like it was well worth the price. <laughs> However, I do want to ask, where in the statute, just give me line and verse, yeah. that that is the definitional core within the statute so it wouldn't be a, a arbitrarily There are, if you're reclaiming my time, just, there I, are. I, I don't want you to restate it. Just tell me what no, page no. and what line I could find that. Reclaiming my time. Uh, there are 50 years of case law which define those terms interpreting this statute. This statute incorporates those 50 years of case law as the way it's written. Is there a place in this bill no, that does that because there's 50 years of case laws with every other statute in this country defines that term. So I just wanted to make sure that there was not a chance for an alternative definition that came out as long as it was codified. As, as there is with, with every constitutional provision, every statute ever written, every ordinance ever written, that's what the courts are for, that's what they do. And if the gentleman would like to get a, another legal opinion, he'd probably have to pay for it. I think a lawyer would tell you the same thing. Well, that would still make me very nervous because I don't want to return those powers over to the, uh, the judicial branch if we could make that decision well, ourselves. Well, does the gentleman the also, by the way, does the gentleman also you regularly protest bills that are thousands? The gentleman can continue the debate, but they're going to have to do it on somebody else's time. Uh, Mr. I, Klein. I thank you for yielding. You're very welcome. You'll, the, bill, the bill is in the mail. <laughs> I, uh, I've heard that so many times. I thank the chairman for yielding. I just want to make a couple of points. I appreciate uh, my learned friend uh, from New Jersey uh, taking on my definition of radical. I, I really don't think that's the issue here. I think the previous discussion about the definitions of knowing and willful are much more to the point. And I think that there are differing legal op opinions, and I'm going to agree with my friend from New Jersey that if we want another one and if businesses want another one, they're going to have to pay for it. And so this is, in my judgment, a, a radical change. And it is worthy of the debate, uh, but it should not be included in this mine safety legislation, which is the point of the gentlelady's amendment. And I urge all of my colleagues to support her amendment, and I yield back. Mr. Wu, were you seeking recognition? Yes, sir. You still want it? Yes, sir. Oh. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, I'm more excited about this than the chairman is, but uh, 
I, I, I want to address a couple of uh, issues which have been raised by the minority uh, because, you know, I, I view uh, enforcement provisions with teeth as something which is very much pro-business because one of the very important things that it does or any enforcement provision with teeth is that um, it reigns in the outliers. And you know, I was a business owner. I mean, after 12 years on this, uh, on this committee, um, one of the themes that I've picked up recurrently uh, is that the folks on the other side of the aisle uh, seem to feel that they're the only folks who have been business owners. And there are at least a few business owners who have been Democrats or are Democrats. Um, and one of the things that really ticked me off as a business owner are outliers, people who break the rules and get competitive advantage as a result of breaking those rules. Now, as an employer, we provided health care, we provided vacation, we provided a good working environment, and I'd hate to see people either get a competitive advantage or uh, take home more money as a result of being an outlier and chiseling on some of those things. So I do think that providing a level field for competition and having a safe working environment is something which is good for just about every legitimate business which is trying to do the right thing. And, and finally, I want to address one point that has been raised on the other side, which is uh, fixing unsafe conditions pending uh, the outcome of enforcement or litigation. And I just want to point out that this provision is something that my state of Oregon has had as, a, as state law for 30 years. And to my knowledge, it has not been controversial. And it, it just makes sense to uh, err on the side of worker safety uh, because these complaints aren't brought up very often and fi making a fix pending outcome is a very, very safe, solid thing to do. I yield back to balance my time. Gentlemen, yields back as others who seek to be heard. If not, the chair will recognize himself. I think we should uh, reject this uh, uh, amendment. Uh, the idea that somehow we cannot do uh, worker safety generally because we have a mine safety bill before us uh, uh, just doesn't make any sense. This committee has he held a whole series of hearings uh, on uh, whether or not OSHA standards have kept up with workplace hazards, uh, uh, workplace tragedy, examining the problems and solutions. Uh, uh, the two, I think two hearings on, on, on the bill which this is part of, the, power, the Protecting Workers' Rights at Work uh, Act, uh, uh, the questions of uh, do OSHA penalties, are they adequate to defer health, uh, to adequate to protect uh, health and safety and, and, and deter violations, uh, improving enhanced enforcement programs, it goes on and on and on. And the point is this committee unfortunately uh, is, is, is confronted with a series of uh, questions around worker health and safety because of what happens out there in the environment. A, 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 uh, uh, a, dust place ex a dust explosion takes place in a mill down in, uh, uh, in, in Georgia and uh, uh, workers are killed and uh, we have to deal with the dust standards. Then, then uh, natural gas is, is improperly pumped into uh, a line in Connecticut and workers are killed. A rig blows up in the, in, in the, uh, on, on the Gulf. It, it refineries blow up. It goes on and on. That's why 15 people don't come home every day when they go to work. And the idea that we cannot deal with those very outdated standards, very outdated protections. According to GAO, OSHA has, a, has the weakest uh, whistleblower protections uh, in, the, in the country. You're right. If you harass a borough, you're in more trouble and, more, and, and, and higher penalties. These penalties, for the most part, have not been updated for 40 years, and this committee can do both, and we owe it to the workers. And, and the idea that, uh, 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 that, that somehow this, this is going to hurt responsible operators. The fact is, you know, a refinery blows up in my district, and I get five calls from the other refinery managers. We don't do business that way. And they want me to come visit the refinery. They want me to see how they handle complaints from the workers, how they handle notifications on safety. The rig goes up in, in April in uh, the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf. 
and I get a CEO of a, of a, of a, from an uh, oil company who's coming to testify in Congress, and he says, we don't do business that way. We do business entirely differently than how BP does. I said, well, you better explain it to the Congress. And they sent me all their charts and all their memorandums and their understanding with their workers on, on anybody can pull the line to stop the, uh, to stop the, uh, the production uh, in, the, in the account of, of safety, and it goes on and on and on. So you have employers who tell us that they're different than the outliers. They don't want to be punished like the outliers. And yet the outliers apparently can continue because everybody in the industry seems to know who the hell they are. They immediately say, oh, that's not us. That's not us. And, and so the, 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 the updating of these laws is important. Uh, people say, well, a fine never deterred anybody. Well, we have a, a system of laws in this country is based upon the fact that, yes, punishment does deter activity. And we have a whole range of civil penalties and criminal penalties that are designed to hold this, this, this country together and, and have people operate in a fashion in which we can, we can maintain a, uh, a, a modern society. And workers are entitled to that, uh, to that protection. And uh, it, it's important that, uh, that we be able to, uh, to do this. We, we, we can do it. The, gr the groundwork has, uh, has been laid. The hearings are there. Uh, we've had the testimony. And uh, the experience is, continues to be out there in the, uh, uh, in, in, in the, in the, in the workplace. And unfortunately, uh, we seem to only be able to move uh, when there's a, after a tragedy, whether it's a tragedy in Connecticut or it's a tragedy in Georgia. Uh, when I first came on this committee, uh, they were blowing up grain elevators left and right, one of the most powerful explosions you could imagine. You see pieces of concrete that are a mile away. Unbelievable. They were just going boom, 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 boom. Well, new dust standards, changes, modernization, different equipment. And you know what? We don't think much about grain elevator uh, explosions anymore in this country. So it does have an impact. It does improve the safety. It does Im uh, improve the insurance rates if you happen to be in the grain elevator business. Uh, and so I think that that's what we've got to keep our eye on, and I would hope that we would, uh, we would not support this, uh, this amendment. Uh, the question comes on the, uh, the amendment by the, the gentleman, Ms. McMorris Rogers. Uh, all those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it, and the gentleman, Mr. Klein, is, is requested a roll call, and a roll call will be uh, uh, postponed uh, pursuant to Committee Rule 15B, Clause 2 of the House <laughs> Rule 11 further proceedings in this moment will be postponed as we've discussed between the, uh, uh, the ranking member and, and, the, uh, and the chair. Are there further amendments? Uh, Ms. Woolsey. Mr. Chairman, I have an, an amendment at the desk. The gentleman from California has an amendment at the, at the uh, desk. Uh, the clerk will designate the amendment and the staff will distribute the amendment. An amendment offered by Ms. Woolsey of California. Reserve a point of order. Uh, Mr. Klein reserves a point of order. And the uh, the gentlewoman is recognized for five minutes to uh, explain her amendment. Mr. Chairman, my amendment will ensure that NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, continue to collaborate with international governments and private industry to share the best technology and knowledge for to improve mine worker safety uh, and health. Uh, currently, NIOSH uh, is responsible for research on mine safety and health, and it has benefited greatly from its collaborations with others on uh, in-mine testing, data sharing, modeling, and other activities. In recent weeks, however, uh, the authority of these uh, collaborations has been questioned, and new collaborations have been halted. So uh, my amendment would specifically establish NIOSH's authority to work with others on mine safety uh, in the law. With that, I, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady for her amendment. Uh, the language is strikingly similar to that found in the Republican uh, substitute. Okay. I, of course, think ours is a little bit better <laughs> and uh, would encourage her to support uh, my <laughs> substitute, uh, but we will support uh, the gentlelady's amendment. The question comes on and the... On the withdraw my, uh, uh, withdraws his point of order. The question is on the amendment by the gentleman from California. All those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Price? Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Sure. 
Chairman, I reserve a point of order. The point of order is reserved. The clerk will designate the amendment. The staff will distribute the amendment. An amendment offered by Mr. Price of Georgia. Okay, give us a minute to get it distributed here. And the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The bill that we're marking up today, the Minor and Safety Health Act of 2010, uh, marks an aggressive expansion in the scope and application of federal mining and workplace safety laws. Uh, part of that is an attempt to foster a more adversarial relationship between the, the nation's mines and businesses and their respective regulators. The vast majority of mine operators and employee, employers uh, do not consist of bad apples, but rather work with minor and employee safety in mind. And it is safety which must be at the forefront of whatever reforms are adopted by Congress, not simply doling out more punishment or generating more litigation. Uh, yet this proposal does not recognize this fact, so my amendment is an attempt to put minor and worker safety at the forefront. To do so requires an honest examination of the bill and the provisions before us. As constructed, it reduces the threshold for criminal liability from willful to knowing, which is truly an astonishing shift. Essentially criminalizes management of a mine or workplace. Uh, further, any violation of any requirement of the Act, no matter how minor, could be construed as a felony. Uh, this is the introduction of a whole new punitive range of minor and workplace safety violations and creates a much lower standard of intent. In some cases, it will be virtually impossible to know if standards have been violated and will take new challenges and litigation to discover, upending decades of existing law and precedent. Finally, all of this is being done in conjunction with substantial increases in civil and criminal monetary penalties. In short, if it's a hostile environment that we're trying to create today, then that's what the committee has been remarkably successful at accomplishing. But in the end, this will serve no one, especially the miners and the workers we are looking to protect. Taking a step back, all of these new liability standards are particularly galling when put in perspective with the testimony that we heard just last week from leading regulators at OSHA, MSHA, and the Department of Labor. Uh, during a questioning uh, portion of that hearing, I held up a story from a uh, newspaper, local newspaper, uh, from that day that highlighted the sta safety hazards in office buildings here at the Capitol Complex. Uh, the article went on to point out that if Congress were a business, it would, it would be at risk for massive fines. <laughs> Labor solicitor Patricia Smith was asked to identify who might be subject to the fines if, in Congress if similar standards from this bill were applied, and she had difficulty identifying those folks. And when pressed about these new standards and asked to identify company officers and directors who would be subject we, we, at mines and workplaces, uh, it was brushed off as a corporate matter which she couldn't answer. Assistant Secretary Joe Main from MSHA verified that inspectors at large mines were there virtually all the time. And the question was raised to the panel as to why we shouldn't apply these new, quote, knowing, unquote, standards to MSHA inspectors as well, since they would know, uh, yet this was simply put aside. Remember that the knowing standard, as has been talked about uh, this morning speaks to simply being aware that something exists. You don't have to know that that something that exists is a violation. Uh, you simply uh, have to know that it exists. Such responses from our top regulators do not exactly inspire a lot of confidence, especially when they're being given an extraordinary amount of new power under this bill to go after mine operators and businesses. If anything, it's a signal of uncertainty to our nation's mines operators and businesses. And given the business climate that this administration and this Congress have created over the last year and a half, more uncertainty and contentious battles with regulators is the last thing that America needs to spur job creation and economic growth. So this bill will harm the very workers that it alleges to help. Adoption of this amendment would go a long way to restoring a positive relationship between miners and businesses and regulators. Uh, I urge adoption of the amendment, and I yield back the time. Gentleman, gentleman back. yields. Mr. Andrews. Mr. Chairman, I rise in opposition to the amendment. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Uh, in one of the hearings in which the committee considered this issue, the uh, witness from the Justice Department, who is responsible for understanding and enforcing this law, interpreting this law, 
uh, frankly not a political person but a, a career person, uh, offered the opinion that the knowing standard is the right standard for a variety of reasons, and we agree with him, which is why the bill points this out. First of all, we often hear from our friends on the other side that they want to discourage an explosion of litigation. Um, I think that, frankly, by clarifying this definition and including the knowing standard, uh, it becomes much more clear what's a violation of the law and what is not. The term willful, uh, the Supreme Court actually made reference in a case called Ratzlaff versus the United States in 1994, said willful is a word of many meanings and its construction is often influenced by its context. There are some people who interpret, as I did this morning, that willful means intentional. You tried to hurt somebody. There are many other cases that would construe that term in a different way and say that you simply uh, did did not act, you could not use ignorance of the law as a defense. The knowing standard has a more robust case law history behind it. It is more clear, and I believe it will discourage an explosion of litigation rather than encourage one. Far more important reason, though, I think, goes back to the example that I talked briefly about with Dr. Rowe. And yes, there, there is, a, I suppose, a substantive difference between those who would support this amendment and those of us who would oppose it, but I would urge you to consider what that difference is. Again, let's assume that we have workers working in a, a room, a chamber, where it is possible that poisonous gas can go into that chamber at another time. And there's a valve that controls the poisonous gas. And uh, in a case where the the, uh, someone acting on behalf of the employer would say, I don't, I don't like the people inside the room, I want to punish them. We're going to turn the valve on and poison them. That's clearly a violation of the law. It's a crime. It's a violation of the law. It's intentional. But is it willful? Is it, is it knowing? I don't think it is. I think it's greater than that, but I think that knowing and willful standard has a different reason. What about the second case, which I talked about earlier? where the employer's safety inspector has said, this valve is not working properly. There's a good chance it's going to leak. As a matter of fact, it leaked yesterday. And, and with that knowledge, the employer permits the workers to go into that chamber, into that room anyway, and they get poisoned and sickened by the gas. Should or should that not be a serious violation of the worker safety law? We think it should. We think it should. And we think the failure to show that somehow or another the employer intended this harm to the worker is really not a standard that's appropriate. Very often that standard is, is interpreted in that way. So this is really all about that case. What do you think the answer should be in that case? If the safety inspector comes to the employer and says, the valve's leaking, it leaked yesterday, it's not working, there's a good chance if someone goes in here today that they're going to get sick and the employer sends the people in anyway. That's a knowing violation. Now, you can argue that that should be treated as a serious violation, or you should argue that it shouldn't be treated as, as a serious violation. That's the question. The gentleman's amendment, I think, says it shouldn't be, because he reverts back to the willful standard, which is ambiguous, confusing, and inadequate. The underlying bill says it should be a serious violation. It's a reasonable difference of opinion. But if you believe that's not a serious violation, you should vote for the gentleman's amendment. If you believe that it is a serious violation, you should vote against the gentleman's amendment. I would urge a no vote and yield back. The yields back. The question comes on the amendment. A, Excuse me, Mr. Rowe wanted to be heard. Just very briefly. The gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of things that uh, my friend from New Jersey said a moment ago in, in discussion of what happened in Connecticut is that and I agree with him totally that we should get all the information, all the information that you possibly can before you make a, a decision. And, and my medical analogy would be if I ordered a lot of tests and then took the patient to the operating room without getting the tests, that would be, I think, a, a, an error in judgment. I think we're doing the same thing here when we're voting on a bill that we haven't waited for the IG's report and other information that will be forthcoming. It's going to be coming pretty quickly. Uh, about what happened, and, and it hasn't been clear through everything I can read 
what was the cause of the accident at the Upper Big Branch Mine. I don't know what caused that yet. So I'd like to know if we could nail that down. And secondly, the example that you used on the valve, what would happen now is if you, uh, an employer discovered the valve was erroneous and that person, uh, he said, we've got a problem with the valve, it's leaking, whatever. And he sends some uh, a work order out to get it fixed. And before he can get it fixed, an accident occurs. Now, he, he willingly uh, tried to fix this problem under current law I think he would be fine. Under this law, the way I understand it is, he could be held uh, liable for this willingly. And I don't think that's the intent of it, I don't believe. Uh, I'd like to yield to my friend from New Jersey and see if he could answer that. I, I'd be happy to, if I understand the facts that you laid out, the employer knows that the valve is defective, sends out a work order, get it fixed, but sends in people to work there anyway. Is that, is that the facts? I'm reclaiming, no, he, he does not send someone in. He sees the valve is there, and before he can get it fixed with a work order, an explosion or an accident occurs and injures workers. No, I don't think that's a violation. No one was injured, and he's made a good faith effort to fix the problem. That's not a violation. Thank, thank you, I just wanna make one quick point. Um, in your, the cases that you're, that you're bringing forward, I'm a manufacturing person. We have two palm buttons. If somebody's got to have two palm buttons, and if one palm button's not working and a guy's operating the machine and a manager knows that, they should be. I mean, that's no, to me, willful. I would put that at willful. Should be for our policies for people to let go immediately for that because you could get hurt. The question, though, and I ha I've had one law school class in my life, and the, and the cases you study aren't those st cases. The cases you study are the ones that are they're studied because they're just not that clear cut. And, and that's, that's where more the debate is. Not the facts of the case you lay out, the facts of the situation that I lay out, that's obvious. It's more of the other, the, and you know that, you know when law yeah. you don't study the, the cases that are clear, you study the things that are yeah. ambiguous, and that's, that's what we're trying to clarify. Well, General Yield, uh, okay. that's, that's sort of the argument I'm trying to make here, that the willful standard is quite ambiguous. There's a lot of courts that, that say, no, you don't have to prove intent you got to just prove something else. And it's created ambiguity. A lot of courts, frankly, have construed willful to mean knowing. Well, rather than have that tortured construction, let's just say knowing. And the example that you used about the two buttons, right. you, I think you would be a knowing that, that's annoying. a knowing violation. Well, let me reclaim, because I, I want to yield to Dr. Price. Yield okay. to Dr. Price. Uh, I thank the gentleman for, for uh, yielding and in, in, uh, in his support. Um, uh, the, the, this discussion is precisely why we ought not be putting in place the, the, the knowing standard. Uh, the gentleman from New Jersey uh, uh, says, well, it's very, very clear. You know, one thing is willing and, and, and uh, or willful, and, and, and the other is, uh, uh, is knowing. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it isn't. Um, to use the type of example that the gentleman used, uh, what if that valve that supposedly controls this noxious gas um, that the inspector looks at, it comes to the, the owner of the mine and says, uh, I don't think there's any problem with that valve. We haven't had any trouble with it at all. Um, I don't think it's going to leak, but, you know, it might. Um, haven't had any problem. Don't think anybody's at risk. I uh, don't think you need to worry about it, but it might. And then something happens. I would suggest that that is uh, in the knowing category and something that, that a, uh, under the current standard would expose uh, will the, the, the mine will to will the, gentleman the mine owner to not not this point, the mine owner to significant fellow felonious penalties, criminal penalties, jail, when when his inspector, when the inspector, when it may be even be the MSHA inspector says there really isn't a problem there. I don't think there's a problem there at all, but it might something might happen, and and to uh, uh, to point out a, a previous ruling by the United States Supreme Court in case Brian versus the United States, the court found uh, that, quote, as a general matter, when used in the criminal context, a willful act is one undertaken with a, quote, bad purpose, unquote. Right. That's right. The contrast is the court stated that, quote, unless the text of the statute dictates, dictates a different result, the term knowingly merely requires proof of knowledge of the facts that constitute the offense, unquote. That's knowing the facts that constitute the offense. It's not knowing that something terrible was going to happen with certainty, or even that it 
might happen. So the, the, the standard that, that, that this, uh, uh, this new provision in, in, in the manager's amendment would provide uh, would hold um, uh, businesses to uh, is a standard that, uh, that I believe exposes individuals to uh, uh, absolute uh, remarkable punishment and creates that adversarial relationship and in fact harms uh, the, very, uh, the very minors and, and the employees uh, that, that, that we're trying to, uh, trying to help. So again, if, if, if what we're trying to do is to create a, an adversarial relationship and punish uh, individuals uh, for um, attempting to be uh, uh, productive and, and, and assist our economy, then we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, if what we're trying to do is to protect the miners and, and, and the workers, um, I, th I think that we are not doing that and, uh, and in fact harming the very individuals that, uh, that we purport to, to help. And I yield back. Back, Mr. Hare. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would yield. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would yield my time to the gentleman from New Jersey. I thank my friend for yielding. Um, we're not about trying to stifle job creation. What we're about is trying to protect the worker who's in that chamber from going in there and being exposed to that noxious gas when the employer knew it was likely to happen. That's what we're trying to do, and we're trying to help employers, as Mr. Wu said avoid hundreds of millions of dollars a year in workers' compensation outlays when people get sick and hurt on the job. Um, but to go back to my friend from Georgia's two examples, I think they make exactly the point that we are trying to make. His one fact pattern was when the inspector comes to the employer and says, the valve looks okay to me. Something could happen, but it looks okay to me. It checked out okay. If the valve then malfunctions and the gas goes in, that's not a knowing violation. At worst, it might be negligent. Maybe the employer should have had a more thorough inspection. At worst, it's not knowing. That's the point. That, that's, that's a distinction there in that case. A and secondly, he uses the example, for, he quotes the Supreme Court as defining willful as having a bad purpose. That's exactly right. That's the point we're making. When you look at the example of the employer who was told, look, this valve isn't working properly. It might leak noxious gas into the chamber. That employer probably didn't have a bad purpose. He didn't want to hurt the people in the room. If he did, it's very difficult to prove because that's the willful standard. What we're saying, though, is if he had actual knowledge that the valve was malfunctioning and said, send him in there anyway. That may not rise to the level of a legally bad purpose under the willful standard, but it sure looks bad to me. It sure looks like the wrong thing to do to me. And under this statute, what we're now proposing is that the employer had actual knowledge under the knowing standard. There's been a serious violation. The workers should not have been sent in and shouldn't have been sickened in that way. That's a, that's a philosophical difference. That's what this amendment is really all about. Again, I, I would um, yield back to my friend for Illinois. I yield back the balance. Gentleman yields back his time. Yields back his time. The question comes on the amendment by the gentleman from Georgia. All those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. 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 Any of the chair, the noes have it. Roll call vote if requested by Mr. Klein. Uh, we have an amendment on, on the majority side. Mr. Hare. Mr. Hare has an amendment at the uh, at the uh, I have an amendment at the desk. Uh, the clerk will designate the amendment. Uh, staff is an amendment offered by Mr. Hare of Illinois. And the uh, report, a uh, point of order, is reserved against the amendment by uh, Ms. Klein. Uh, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes to explain his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me begin. Uh, let me begin by thanking you and the staff of the uh, of the committee for your tireless work on this legislation. I appreciate uh, your working with me on this amendment and for the leadership you've taken on this issue. Uh, while the legislation before us today <clears throat> excuse me, has a section dealing with requirements for contractors and operators to separately report their injuries, illnesses, and hours of work at each specific mine, this bill does not put in place appropriate accountability measures to address underreporting where it does occur. <clears throat> there are not enough auditors at MSHA to audit every mine's books each year to assure accuracy, and we need a deterrent for those who would try to knowingly game, game the system. 
Testimony received by this committee at the hearing on this bill last week from Cecil Roberts of the United Mine Workers and Mr. Stanley Goose Stewart, who worked for Massey Energy at the Upper Big Branch Mine, described how operators go to extensive lengths, such as bringing injured workers back from the hospital to the mine and keep them seated in the office even though they are too injured to work in order to keep injury reporting numbers down. Both urged the committee to address this problem. Miners in my home state of Illinois provided information on a safety incentive program at their mine where they are docked bonus pay if one of their fellow miners has a reportable accident or injury. This incentive program could encourage safer work, but it also causes miners to underreport rather than incur the wrath of their fellow miners. This undermines the credibility of an enforcement re regime that commands accurate data for it to target MSHA's resources at mines that merit increased scrutiny and warrants action by this committee as recommended by the witnesses that testified last week. Mr. Chairman, my amendment will require that accident, injury, and illness reports to MSHA be signed by, quote, a knowledgeable and responsible person possessing a certification as determined by the Secretary or a state certification program, unquote and further states that an individual's certifications can be revoked for knowingly falsifying reports or logs under this act. My amendment provides a mechanism for accountability with the person signing the report or log, and it is my hope that it will curb the common practice of underreporting injuries and accidents. Operator and contractor reports of accidents and injuries are important, not only for operators and miners to track safety performances, but for M should attract mines that have elevated rates, which is why we need to eliminate any chance that they're not fully accurate. For that reason, I would ask my colleagues to join me in supporting this common sense amendment. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, yields back the balance of time. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we are, uh, frankly, struggling to uh, understand a number of things about the gentleman's amendment. Uh, it's not clear to me or to us what a responsible per person who this responsible knowledge knowledgeable and responsible person pos possessing a certification a registration qualification or other approval and what those certifications registrations qualifications or other approvals might be and we're trying to find where that is addressed under section 118 which is uh, or eight no it's Okay, which is uh, injunctions. So I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm not uh, <clears throat> supporting or not supporting the amendment. I'm trying to understand it, and, and I know that uh, my time will run out. We're looking, I but think, maybe the just correction, I think we're looking at uh, page 68. Page 68 of uh, the bill or the, uh, page 68 of the bill? Amendment and a, and a substitute. Oh, the amendment the page 68 of the amendment and nature to manage the amendment. Okay. Page 68. It's here. And this it's under section 118 of this. First to the certification process in section Yeah, line line 14 on page 68. So we're 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 we creating we're creating something new here, including a mandatory health or safety. Let me have counsel. Understanding. Uh, any, any help in understanding? Well, would, sure. Would Mr. Mr. Be Klein, we'd be, we'd, we'd be pleased. Um, <clears throat> Section 118 of the Act authorizes MSHA to establish a certification program for the qualifications of miners, foremen, electricians, and so forth. Um, it then um, authorizes the states, which they currently do, which, are, which have minor certification programs, um, to meet certain minimum requirements for certifications, for recertifications, and revocations. So when you look at the amendment from Mr. Hare, where it says that knowingly falsifying such records or reports shall be grounds for revoking such certification, registration, and qualification, with the approval standards uh, established under Section B1, if you turn to page 69, I believe it is, of the amendment in the nature of the substitute, 
It specifically lays out the establishment of the certification requirements and procedures. Um, the procedures under C, which is on line 17, deal with the procedures and criteria for revoking such certification, registration, qualification, or other approval, including, and, and it goes on. So what this amendment says is that the, uh, that, that when an operator or a contractor uh, is submitting reports uh, on a, either a quarterly or annual basis regarding accident and injury rates and illness rates and the number of hours worked in order to calculate that, that needs to be accurate. And what this says is that the individual who has to fill that out is somebody who has to have a certification, meaning it just can't be any old Joe. It has to be somebody who's got, say, a certified foreman. A foreman are certified in all underground coal mines, for example. Uh, they would be a certified individual that would fall under this ambit. If a certified um, foreman falsif knowingly falsified injury or illness records that were submitted uh, on, on, on the basis of MSHA requirements, um, then this could provide a sanction for those who inaccurately report, knowingly or uh, knowingly falsifying such reports. I, I thank you. Um, that, that does provide some clarification. Certainly anybody who is knowingly uh, falsifying records reports, who is knowingly lying, uh, should be sanctioned and revoking whatever the certification, registration, qualification, or other approval is um, seems sort of a, a minimum. Uh, we're still trying, to, I'm still trying to understand, and I've got the, the help of uh, the cavalry, as the chairman referred to them over here, just determining who these people are. And I, I guess certification, registration, qualification, or other approval, and that's as provided for under Section 118, and I'm trying to sure understand how that's, right? how that's provided for under 118. Is sure. something special, or is it just... You know, a cracker jack box deal. I don't, I don't understand. What, 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 what's happened here is currently um, under almost all states, they currently have certification programs for the qualifications of certain job categories of people who operate in mines. And it varies depending on surface or subsurface. What this establishes here is minimum criteria that states have to meet with respect to certification, recertification, and revocation of certifications. Okay, and the states have come forward and supported this approach, setting a minimum set of criteria that they would have to come up to. It wouldn't preempt the states, it wouldn't jeopardize the states' authorities, but if to the degree and extent they don't do so, then MSHA would step in and do those certifications in lieu of. Um, that's the certification we're referring to, that's sir. That's the certification you would lose. That's the certification that's at jeopardy, and an example would be a foreman or a section boss would be a common um, certified job title. Uh, still my time. Yeah, yeah I, again, I thank you, and, and I, I think that's a, a good explanation, but uh, I'm still confused. And, and the cavalry is uh, a little bit confused over here. Uh, we certainly agree, as I said earlier, that if anybody certified, registered, qualified, or, or anything else is knowingly falsifying records, we support that. I'm reluctant, frankly, to, <coughs> to support the amendment uh, just because uh, we're operating in a little bit of a cloud of dust. Here. As I understand, the, the, if the gentleman would yield. Uh, happy, happy to As yield. I understand the, the, the amendment, just a minute, that we're requiring that a certified person uh, be responsible for putting together these reports. What that person has at risk is if they knowingly falsify those reports, they could lose their certification. Right. I, I'm, I, I think I, I mean, I understand what, what the gentleman's trying to do. Um, I'm, I'm not vehemently opposed to this by any stretch of imagination. I, I just am worried. We've got this whole knowingly thing again in here. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what that means. I'm, I'm really not sure, even though I'm, I'm learning rapidly here uh, from Council a little bit more about this certification, registration, qualification, or other approval, uh, all which seems uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit ambiguous. So I, I thank all concerned for their explanation. I yield back. Thank you. The question comes on the amendment by the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Hare. All those in favor will say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, Ms. Titus, I believe, uh, has an amendment. The clerk will designate the amendment by the gentlewoman from Nevada, and the staff will, will distribute the amendment. An amendment offered by Ms. Titus of Nevada. 
we have an explanation for the minimum wage. Yes, we do. The I reserve point of order. The uh, re uh, point of order is reserved by the gentleman from Minnesota the, and the gentlewoman. Uh, is recognized to uh, ex explain her amendment. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The bill before us today includes important protections for all workers, whether they are employed in the mines or in any other uh, work site. My home state of Nevada is one of 22 U.S. states that operate their own occupational safety and health administration programs. These state programs are required by law to be at least as effective as comparable federal standards. Yet Section 709 of the underlying bill recognizes the fact that changes to OSHA do not automatically apply to states with an already approved state plan. The bill instead instructs these states to change their plans to comply to changes in federal law, but what if a state chooses not to comply? Issues of state noncompliance have been brought to light in Nevada and were the subject of a hearing in front of this committee last October. What was clear from Federal OSHA's special review of Nevada's OSHA enforcement program is that Nevada OSHA has not been enforcing workplace health and safety standards as well as should have been the case. In fact, the deficiencies discovered in Nevada were so glaring that the Department of Labor initiated in-depth reviews of all state plans, and those reviews will be released shortly. Yet even before the final reports are issued, it's clear that the Department of Labor lacks effective enforcement tools. That's why Assistant Secretary of Labor for OSHA, David Michaels, expressed his support for additional enforcement tools, such as the one contained in this amendment, when he testified in front of the Workforce Protection Subcommittee in March. Under current law, federal OSHA has only two options to make Nevada or any other state with an approved plan follow through on their obligations to workers. One, they can ask nicely and hope that the state complies. Or two, they can take the drastic action of terminating the state plan. This is an extreme step that would remove state control, leave state and local government employees unprotected, and add cost to the Department of Labor for funding and running a health and safety program for the state. That's why I'm offering an amendment which will provide a middle ground. This amendment will protect both workers and states' rights by giving OSHA options other than complete plan termination when a state plan is found underperforming. The amendment establishes a formal mechanism for OSHA to identify a problem with a state plan and compel a remedy without beginning the process for withdrawing approval. And it ensures that there will be continued application of health and safety regulations but by providing OSHA with concurrent enforcement authority for the duration of the time that a state plan is formally fixing deficiencies. There are opportunities for states to appeal and to fix problems within certain deadlines. My amendment also holds federal OSHA accountable for providing strong oversight and guidance to state plans by establishing a regular GAO study, one every five years, to look at the effectiveness of state plans and the Secretary of Labor's oversight of such plans. The study would also include a look at funding of state OSHA plans, which under existing law is supposed to be 50-50, 50 percent from the states and 50 percent from the federal government. We know that many states are currently paying more than their 50 percent, including, among others, Minnesota, Washington, Kentucky, and California. So I would urge all of my colleagues to support this amendment, which will protect workers and also protect states' rights, provide some middle ground, and move us forward in helping to protect folks on the ground and on the job. So I yield back the balance of my time and ask for your support. The gentlewoman yields back the balance of time. Mr. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, still talking to the cavalry. Uh, I thank the gentlelady for offering her amendment. It looks to me like this is going to have an, an impact on every state with a state plan, and I'm not sure exactly what that impact is. I, I am very much aware that there are issues concerning Nevada. We've had hearings specifically about Nevada. And so I understand the, the gentlelady's concerns, but I, I'm trying to understand the, uh, the complete impact of this. I mean, part of the language says not later than 18 months after the date of enactment 
of this subsection, and every five years thereafter, the Controller General shall complete and issue a review of the effectiveness of state plans to develop and enforce safety and health standards. Um, I'm, again, I'm not, I'm a little bit unclear as to why the Controller General is doing that, unless we're looking for a, a disinterested third, third party. Um, Again, I, I'm, I'm sure the gentlelady is well intentioned, and this may be a, a fine amendment, but I don't yet understand what the impact will be on the states, including my own state, and, and their plan. So I, I, I reluctantly, I can't step out and support or endorse this amendment because I think that it may have some unintended consequences in, in states around the country. Um, so I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair would recognize himself just quickly. I, I, I think uh, the gentlewoman has, has done a, a very good job of, of sorting this out. Uh, what we found ourselves in after the situation in, in Nevada and maybe in a couple of other states uh, was the only thing that was left was a massive confrontation. And uh, so what the gentlewoman has suggested is that without beginning that process of withdrawal, we've encouraged state plans that, that meet the standards uh, and, and many states have, have done that, and I, we, I think we want to keep that regime in place, but there has to be some ability uh, uh, for, for corrective action. Uh, uh, what happened here was uh, it appears that OSHA just sort of wandered off uh, and, and, and wasn't paying attention to what was going on in Nevada. We had a tragic set of, of accidents in the construction trades uh, there, uh, uh, the, several of which clearly appeared to be preventable. Uh, so this allows a mechanism to go through and then uh, so that we don't get a situation where OSHA and the state plans are drifting apart and then we find out we don't have uh, adequate worker protection. The, the five-year review I think is helpful both to OSHA and to the state plans and again it doesn't require then that you jerk back uh, the state plan and you, and you, you get into that and so I, I think it, it, it's helpful in, in the maintenance of, of, of the idea of the state plans and the confidence uh, in those plans uh, by those by those uh, workers obviously who are covered uh, in those states I would I would be I know the gentleman uh, this this has been a freestanding bill but the gentleman has a focus I, I would hope that we would accept the amendment and then clearly if, if questions are uh, come up about it we'd be happy to work uh, with the uh, 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 with the gentleman uh, from Minnesota, Mr. Klein, on, on the specifics of, the, of those concerns if they're, if they're raised after this. But I think this is uh, a, a, a good solution to, to what was a very serious problem and clearly could just happen again by a set of circumstances. It shouldn't be allowed to go unintended, but it shouldn't become a huge confrontation in terms of trying to remedy uh, uh, the, the requirements to protect, uh, protect the workers. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not, the question uh, arises on the amendment for the gentlewoman from Nevada. All those in favor will say aye. aye. The, those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. Uh, I believe there are no further amendments to the bill. The chair will state at this time that we were, thought we were going to be able to shoot a gap here between people who were at the White House the votes on the floor and people who are going to the White House, that doesn't appear to be possible uh, since somewhere they're crossing on that two-way street uh, between the Capitol and the White House. Uh, so it's the intent of the chair that we would begin the roll call votes at 2 at two o'clock. Uh, again, I don't know what the floor situation will be at that time, but that would be the intent. Uh, we'll go through the roll the first time slowly on the first roll call, but we will, we will remind all of your offices uh, of that prior to 2 o'clock uh, that uh, we, will, we will begin taking the roll calls and then the vote on passage of the, uh, of the legislation. Thank you very much for your cooperation. It's kind of an unusual day because of external events, but thank you. And we will, the committee will stand in recess uh, until 2 o'clock and, and then we'll begin.